Thank you for that great introduction. All right, so, so we've broken earlier. Okay. First of all, I kind of want to explain what undergraduate engagement librarian means because I actually kind of think my title is a bit of a misnomer. I'm more like a student success librarian. They just weren't sure that that's what they wanted to call it at the time. And I'm actually petitioning to have my title changed, but that's a slow process as any of you might know, working through an administration. Um, I can't even really get my department head on board yet, but we'll get there, we'll get there. Um, I'm also a liaison to anthropology, sociology, gender and women's studies. And I'm an information literacy slash first year experience instructor. And that's part of the reason I want to get my title changed. Uh, the first year experience class that I was given was not originally part of my um, job duties. So we have a new pilot program um, at the university, and I'll talk about it a little bit more um, in depth. But basically, it started the same time I got here. So, which was January, 2019. And so fresh meat, new blood, let's get her hooked kind of thing. Um, the person who really knew it had been elevated to associate dean. And um, associate deans have a lot of work to do. They do not have time to be teaching um, class, especially when you're trying to completely reconstruct how the class works. All right. I'm going to start with um, our definition of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, read this so that anybody who uh, might not have uh, read it themselves for vision problems. Uh, diversity is differences in pedagogy, religion, age, ability, sexual orientation, gender, identity, expression, race, or ethnicity. Equity is in the playing field. And inclusion is providing the opportunity for full participation to every person by understanding their unique needs. So they kind of play with each other. Um, diversity is the thing that exists, whether we acknowledge it or not. Diversity exists. And it is up to us to add the inclusion part to try to reach equity. That's how I like to think of it. Um, but they are different things. and and you do different things to address each part. And this is paraphrased from our strategic plan for diversity, inclusion, and equity uh, that was written in 2020, but worked on for several years before that. Um, all right, first I'm gonna start with the basis in the credit bearing class, but I am also gonna talk a little bit about one-shot teaching. So if there are any of you out there going, oh, I am never going to be able to get a credit bearing class. It's okay, I got you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so as I said, this was a new program. Um, what we were doing basically was taking existing credit classes and putting first year experience topics in those existing classes. So a kind of infused model. Um, and we were specifically targeting students who were at risk for dropping or stopping out um, and putting them in these classes. My, my student population it's almost always um, exploratory major. That's what we call it when you're undeclared, essentially. Um, that's what we called it at my alma mater, but here we call it exploratory major. Um, most of them are exploratory, not because they don't know what to do, but because they did not get into their major of choice. We have some very selective programs at our university, among which is nursing, um, which is a... I feel like a, a, an area that a lot of people want to go into because they know medical professionals in their own lives and they want to help people. And it seems like an easy way to start helping people with maybe less education than say being a doctor. For one thing that's changing because there's a, a lot of places that are requiring the master's degree after a certain amount of time and all of that. Um, but also our program specifically is highly selective. We have about a hundred spots and we have way more than a hundred people who get in. Um, and so there's three steps to the process. I'm not going to bore you with the details, but, but these are the people who never had a shot, essentially. Um, there are other places where people can fall out of the program and have to switch programs. But these are the people who never had a shot. 
Um, they're often uh, under underrepresented minority students or and or first generation or Pell Grant recipients. Um, they don't have they usually don't have a ton of experience with information literacy, but every once in a while, I'll get a student from one of our, our early college, high school, or something like that, who just didn't quite make the cut. Um, and I feel like, despite them being probably the most prepared for college, they are also probably the most likely to leave us, because they will find a college that wants them aka a college that will let them into the program that they actually want. Um, and so therefore, all of these students struggle with belonging for a various amount of reasons. <laughs> all right. One of those reasons, of course, is, is with them being mainly under lack of uh, attention to diversity. We were talking about redeveloping how the first year experience went and how it was going to go specifically in these classes. We talked a lot about the, the idea of a diversity day. Um, lots of classes have like a day set aside where we'll have uh, somebody from the diversity office come and talk to them, but that'll be it. Um, that's not a very effective way if what you are trying to do is make people feel comfortable. If what you're trying to do is, is a bunch of students who have no concept of diversity, diversity, then that's great. But if you're working with a population for whom diversity is essential to their belonging, it's not going to be great. Um, and we have access to diversity-oriented speakers if we want to use them. And some of us do use these to like introduce the concept of diversity, especially if they have a much more mixed class than I do. I just happened to end up um, my first and second semesters with a much higher URM proportion than other people. I've now taught this for four semesters and my second two semesters, I haven't had quite as um, obvious a slant toward URM, though I do still have URM students. Um, demographics have definitely shifted because of the pandemic. Um, just to remind everybody of the timeline here, my first class was taught in fall 2019. So I literally had one class that I taught before the pandemic hit. <laughs> so things definitely changed. Um, but we decided because my class specifically and a lot of the classes had a higher proportion of URN students to focus on embedding diversity into the course. Um, stop here and mention that a lot of the ACRL framework actually lends itself to this very easily. Um, the things I'll be talking about specifically are authority is constructed and contextual, that information has value, that research is inquiry or exploration, and that scholarship is a conversation. All right, so keeping those four things in mind, but wanting to work with the whole ACRL framework, I rearranged how the class ran entirely. Um, first, I did all the skills. So for the first half of the semester, we talk about skills. We talk about how to get good results from anywhere from the web to the catalog to our databases. We do that whole thing. And then we sort of, now that they've had the like skills and understand what they are supposed to be doing, we talk about the why and the how understanding why can help them do it better. Um, in that second half, we talk a lot about their past research experience. Um, we talk about it a little bit as we're going through the skills because I'll ask, hey, have you done this? Have you done that? But we talk a lot about it a lot more in the second half. Like, did you know that uh, not everybody is going to have access to these databases after you leave college do you understand how that's going to affect you do you remember how it was when you were in high school and you didn't have access how does that change how you feel about research that sort of thing um we encourage debate discussion and defensive sources we actually have a day set aside that is an actual debate day um they get to pick the topic but they have to bring two sources and that's where i start talking about how information has value and how authority is constructed 
um, because I allow them to use first person experience if it is appropriate. It hasn't been appropriate in all of the topics, but um, one of the topics we did was working from home. That was, that was the semester that we all went online abruptly and they asked me if we could change the topic to working from home because they had just all had a lot of experience. And so everybody had an idea and some people's firsthand experience was more valuable than others, I would say. We had a, a non-traditional student who was working from home, literally doing their actual like job in addition to class. Um, and, and we all felt like that was, we talked about that and we all felt like that first person experience was a little bit better um, than maybe these students who weren't doing jobs or whatnot. Um, and then lastly, uh, I made sure that everything is accessible when we do, um, when we teach this class, even when it's not online, all of the materials are available online. So, and they have been checked for accessibility. And um, I use the Blackboard on board accessibility. And I know it's not perfect, but for somebody who has absolutely no background in accessibility at all, it was a great first place to start. And it taught me a lot of things. Um, there are things that the Microsoft so like PowerPoint won't catch that Blackboard definitely will. And I will tell you that I did not take this presentation through the Blackboard checker. And I feel like it probably would have yelled at me for um, a couple of things that are technically uh, decorative, but it probably would have yelled at me for, um, even though I am using the university's template. So take from that what you will. Um, but that way everybody can have everything and um, that that prevents um, a little bit of awkwardness because there are definitely students, especially underrepresented minority students who don't feel comfortable asking for accommodations until they realize how bad it's impacting their grade. And this just sort of gives them um, a little bit of a leg up so they're not falling behind super fast. All right, so talking about all of that stuff that I did in my credit bearing class, how I talk about how they may not have access to things after the class, how they are probably realizing that there are certain voices that are not in the research material at this time, talking about how we don't value lived experience as much as we should because we aren't taught how to evaluate it, all of that here are some changes that I made to my one-shot classes. So the first is encouraging diverse voices. Um, when I teach a one-shot class, I emphasize the importance of different perspectives. It's kind of easy in my disciplines. As you remember, it's anthropology, sociology, women's studies, gender studies. We've kind of been doing this already. Um, but I... Um, I want to tell them that explicitly because I feel like sometimes that message is lost, especially when I'm working with like maybe like 2000 level students and, and, and even, I don't really get to talk to the 1000 level students much because they mostly don't do a whole lot in the discipline yet. But the 2000 is like sort of the intro to the discipline class that I teach, um, the one shot up, obviously. And I feel like being explicit is kind of important at that that phase, um, being more implicit later on down the line is okay, but tell them at least once out loud that different perspectives are important. <laughs> um, we discussed the importance of diversity in research. Um, I often give them examples of how medical research has gone awry. Um, because it's something that affects all of us at some point. I mean, we're all sitting here in a pandemic waiting for vaccine. Um, so at some point, medical, the importance of diversity in research uh, is going to hit us all. Um, so I, I use mostly medical ones, but I have a couple ones that aren't medical, just them a little bit more interested. Um, uh, I talk about how they should be persisting in college um, and how to do so like if it comes up in a class that I'm not really the one who's teaching I have the knowledge of all of those resources and so I can I can tell them I don't have to defer to the, the professor of record um, and I also try to highlight some alternative resources 
um, which has been especially helpful during COVID because I knew a lot of open access things that are available online that they did not have to come to the university for, did not have to be logged into a proxy server for, et cetera. Um, so that actually helped me and I didn't even know it was going to help. All right, I do highlight, like I said, access issues post-college. We discuss information inequity, how it's very hard for people who do not have access to the university to get good scholarly resources. Um, and that means that they need to be able to discern reliability regardless of the medium, going back to all information has value, but all information has differing amounts of value. Um, and that is something that I can basically work in any class because I will just show them two different kinds of sources and tell them which one do you think is more reliable and why. Um, that's an exercise I do in almost every class I teach. Um, it can be very long. It can be very short, depending on how much emphasis I want to put on it. Um, sometimes we break up into groups and have them compare. Sometimes I just compare in front of the classroom. It really kind of depends on the amount of so identify sources of diverse di voices in the discipline, like I was trying to say before, I, ha I have never sent a department all email before to try to hunt down actual diverse voices. And I hope that your uh, colleagues would be well versed enough to not have to do that. Um, but sometimes even in disciplines that I know, I do need to ask the people who are practicing every single day because they might know some new voices that I don't know about. Uh, use examples to discuss the impact of diversity. Um, and then the thing that I really feel like is important for our sense of belonging to make sure we aren't alienating students is uh, to use a little bit of a warm up for particularly contentious topics, uh, to sort of walk them through the topic before you really start like getting into the meat of it and make sure that nobody is uncomfortable and if they are uncomfortable addressing that um, in as, as calm and uh, not singling them out way as possible. Um, and then finally, when you are, are talking about sources and where you're finding them and how you're finding them, ask whose voice might be missing from the discussion and where you might be able to find that voice or how you can lift up that voice. All right, All right. the last thing is, Thing on framing administrative conversations. I've been lucky. I was asked by the associate dean to get involved in this, and so they're expecting it from me, but not everybody is going to have that backing. Um, so first of all, you need to explain to the administration that information literacy and library resources can inherently support a more diverse community, and I really don't know that there are any uh, universities out there that aren't don't have diversity on their radar in some capacity. Um, so that actually helps your library because then you become part of like that supporting pillar of holding up diversity. Um, make sure that your messaging is consistent. Um, don't be explaining things to one administrator one way and then another administrator the other way. It might sound like a good idea at the time because you're playing to like the things that they like, but then you might get questions of, well, why didn't you mention that to me? Are you really sure you could do that? Because you didn't tell me you could do that, that sort of thing. Um, like I said, actively supporting diversity goals adds value to the library. That's the thing we're always talking about um, at my library and at my old library and at every library I've been to is how can we explain to the campus community that the library is still important, still relevant, still has value. This is the one, one of the ways we can do it. Um, and it doesn't cost anything to make any of these changes. You're not buying new material. You're not training people. If anything, you're taking advantage of other university resources to maybe have a sort of a diversity day of your own to make sure all of your uh, fellow librarians are up to speed, but it's not going to be a, a huge multi-million dollar task. It's not like when we put in um, all of the technology in our library to make sure that students were coming to it. This is something that we can do with minimal budget impact, but also give the library a whole lot of value. All right, so my conclusions are frame the conversation with administration first for maximum support, especially if you think you're going to have pushback on how changing how your instruction goes. We have a lot of flexibility with how we do our instruction here, um, but I interviewed at 12 different universities before I got to this job, and I know that's not true for every university. <laughs> um, 
begin with small changes. Uh, a lot of what I just covered is relatively small and you don't have to do every single thing I said at once. Just maybe just like asking a couple of questions about how the, how the discipline is reacting to diversity uh, might uh, help you, especially in those one shot classes. Um, engage in conversations with instructors of record. Be honest and upfront. I I talk to instructors at length, probably more than they really care to have me talk to them about exactly what they expect from my one shot classes. Um, and I have also talked to my in fellow my fellow instructors of record um, in the first year experience to see how they're doing things. We actually have a whole community of practice, so I get to talk to them all the time. Um, and then refer back to the examples presented here for some ideas on how you can start that conversation and start moving forward in including diversity, equity, and inclusion as a concept in your teaching. Okay, I'm ready for questions. Well, thank you so much, Jennifer, for presenting and for sharing your expertise with us. Uh, so now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Lauren, uh, who will ask the questions that were posed. Hi, Jennifer. Thank you. We just have, we just have a few questions. Uh, the first one is something that you mentioned earlier on in your presentation, which is what does struggling with belonging mean? Okay. So struggling with belonging is basically the idea that students um, aren't really fitting in at college. They may have trouble making friends. It's especially been hard during COVID. Um, but if a student doesn't feel like they are the same as their peers, they may not feel like they belong in college and they may drop out. They may stop out for a semester or more. My old job, I was at a university that was a transfer from a community college and we did upper level stuff. And we had this problem all the time. People would get to a certain level of like work, a level of expectation, and they would feel like they were imposters. I'm sure everyone here is familiar with imposter syndrome. I am a 35 year old woman living in this country. I have definitely had imposter syndrome. And it's basically that, but at the beginning of college and it can be enough for students to just want to leave. Great, thank you, Jennifer. Uh, the next question is also about belonging. In terms of belonging and higher education changing and how we are stuck in a past mindset of the college experience. Um, so this person is basically asking, you know, even though it's a huge question, like with higher education changing, are we stuck in a past mindset of the college experience? Like, do we need to brought up, be brought up into like 2021? Yes. <laughs> Short answer is yes. Longer answer is that is part of what my, me and my colleagues in the first year experience pilot are trying to do is we are trying to get rid of that mindset, at least in our classes. Um, a lot of times I will explicitly tell students, unfortunately, not every professor you encounter is going to have the same mindset as me. I am trying to give you tools to be able to handle those people. <laughs> I'm not sure that my colleagues would exactly be happy with saying it that way, but I try to be pretty blunt with my students that I, I'm the friendly aunt. You're eventually going to get to the crotchety old grandmother or grandfather. 